Um, with that, I'll uh, introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Lance Waller, is uh, Rollins Professor and Chair of the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. So, thank you, Dr. Waller. Thanks. It's a, a pleasure to be here. We thought to kick off the workshop, we'd start with two statisticians. Um, nothing, nothing gets things to blood boiling like that. Um, uh, Chris and I both work with uh, CHEER, the CHEER project you'll hear more about later. Um, but we also work on, the, we're, our two talks are tied to present the, the extremes we're thinking about. So when you hear about data science and big data, the, the joke someone passed on to me was identical twins, One's a pessimist, one's an optimist, but they want to see what's going on. So the, the, the pessimist child is put in a room full of toys and won't touch anything and cries. They're afraid they're going to break something. The other gets put in a stable that hasn't been cleaned for six months and dives in head first, starts digging around and goes, there's got to be a pony. Um, <laughs> and I think sometimes we have too many pony talks and not enough uh, I'll break something talks. And uh, I'm coming from the pony end of the spectrum, and Chris is coming from the other. We'll meet in the middle, and it set the stage for a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, so just to set things, get us started in the morning, the coffee's kicking in. What do we want to do? Well, we're really after improving public health. We'd like to monitor exposures, environmental exposures, to see what's going on. We'd like to monitor health outcomes to see what's going on uh, as well. We would like to link these exposures to health outcomes, and we'd like to identify, propose, test, implement, and evaluate potential interventions to try to make changes. And then we want to monitor the health and policy outcomes to see how well we're doing. So what tools do we have to do this? Well, we have a, a wide range of them, and we have representation in the room from a lot of these different areas. We have exposure science. We have toxicology. We have systems biology, what happens outside your body and inside your body. We have epidemiology, what happens to groups of people. We have biostatistics, how do we add it together and measure the associations and the uncertainty. And we have computing to do the informatics and set it all up and, the, and manage the gigabytes of data we're generating every day. And we have data. We have lots and lots of data. So when I'm teaching, I usually teach a geographic information systems class that I haven't done for several years because I'm a department chair, but I look forward to doing it again soon. Um, this is something that came out of uh, work with the local EPA uh, chapter when I first moved to Emory, John, um, John Richardson. I wish this was on the back of an envelope. It would be a better story. But he said, it's just like this. And he drew this picture. And I said, can I use that? And so this is one of two slides that are in this talk that are in all of my talks. Um, we start in the upper left, just the process. We have some questions we want to answer. Those are usually conceptual. You know, what is causing this or what can we do to ameliorate it? We go below. Uh, uh, before we do anything, we should think about what data would help us answer that question. Uh, what do we need to know in order to answer that question to the level and the accuracy and the precision that we want? And then we move over to the reality check of what data can we get and what methods do we have to deal with those data. If we have a new type of data, we may not have methods to deal with it. We'll have to figure that out. Well, once we take the data we can get and we have some methods we're familiar with using, we do answer some questions. So there's the questions we can answer with those data and those methods. And then the last and probably most important step is to see how close that is to the question you really wanted to answer. Um, and then you go around. This is, this is uh, present. Um, my wife and I met in graduate school. She also teaches statistics and probability. Um, my father's a statistician. My brother's married to a statistician. So come on over to our house. <laughs> uh, we don't get a lot of friends. Now, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's, well, I have theories about that. We can talk about it. Um, but the arrows going around and around are important. And I presented this to my wife teaches first year and second year students at Georgia Tech. And um, one of them said, well, how do you know when you're done? And I said, well, that's, I've been doing this for 27 years, and I haven't finished it yet. And the real question is not, did you answer the only question you had? It's, are you closer to the big question you started with? Did you learn more than you knew before? Because if you're not close, or once you define how close you are, that should send you around again. What data would I need to get closer? OK, what else could I get? In, in the GIS world, we'll take the census data, but we'd really like to know more detail about people. So may, that's more work, so I don't use it the first time around. But if I got it, or I got it for a subsample, I could do more. Um, so what's new that we're going to be talking about today and tomorrow, there's concepts and questions. Sometimes they're the same questions, but sometimes we have some new concepts that help us rethink that as we make our path around. We have new measurements, so there's new types of data available. 
uh, we have new calculations and methods we can do, but we also need to have that last step of critiquing our, our answers. And, and then the big question is, are we getting better answers? Are we getting new answers to these questions? Um, the exposome was mentioned. I'm, it's not a new idea here, but uh, Chris Wilde discussed, you know, you know, parallel to the genome, the exposome is kind of everything. And then Gary Miller and Dean Jones um, operationalized this a bit. We have an um, exposome research center at Emory that Gary leads. Uh, it's, it captures the essence of nurture. It's the summation and integration of the external forces acting upon your genome throughout the lifespan. So uh, there are several funded research centers. Some of them, there's, there's three in the EU that are funded, Helix, Heals, and Exposomics. Uh, I think the call for uh, the next round of centers is coming out this summer. Um, so each of those websites has lots and lots of information. And then um, the Hercules, the most ostentatious acronym, um, no, I'm not setting this, the bar. I mean, I, hats off to Gary, who was going to come today. Uh, Hercules actually stands for Human Exposome Research Center Understanding Lifetime Exposures. Um, so uh, that's a good one. Uh, so I, I really like, I lead the data science core for uh, the, the Hercules Center, and it's very interesting work. It's different every day. Um, about the concept, it's unmeasurable. At least the genome ends. The exposome is we want to measure everything all the time. So that's a good concept to keep in mind. We can't measure it. Uh, it's intangible. We can't buy an exposome monitor and clip it on with your name tag. But I think the concept's incredibly helpful. So I'm, I've, I like the idea. I use it for framing a lot of this. But there are critics about, oh, it's just an idea and we really have to get to work. But let's keep in mind it's unmeasurable, intangible, and incredibly helpful. So you want to measure everything all the time. You might want, you know, I remember first being exposed to environmental health in graduate school and talking about ambient, personal, and delivered exposures. Uh, there are mixtures of exposures. We have a lot of epidemiology studies of single air pollutants at a time, but you don't breathe one thing at a time. Uh, we have lots of sensors and monitors that measure all sorts of things, and we need to put them together. Uh, we have what you eat. We have what you drink. We have the air you breathe, the soil that you walk on, the food you, food you eat, which is part of diet. Uh, clinical information, we have longitudinal and spatial data, where you are, when you were there. We have both. We can track those things. We have large and small scale. So if we had everything, where would we put it? Um, so one example, and, and those, this is the other slide that's in all my talks because I'm a spatial epi person. So this is Jon Snow. You're familiar with this story. And in the lobby, up in the upper left-hand corner of the facing wall to the door is a, is a Jon Snow cholera map. So this is London in 1854. Uh, a, a close colleague of mine, co-author on our spatial analysis book, Carol Gottway, added sound effects to this slide at one point, and it's sort of a random chance of whether I have a copy that has the sound or not. <laughs> I think I removed it. Um, it's a little uh, over the top. But... Okay, good. I took it out. So the way the story goes, Jon Snow made the map. He looked at the Broad Street pump, and he said, oh, great, Scott, it's the pump. We should take the handle off. And um, Snow's stuff is brilliant. I mean, reading the original papers, it's very current thinking. It, it really set the stage for investigations, and this isn't the only study he did, but we've sort of compressed it into a public health fairy tale, and I think we need to expose um, ourselves and our students to more of it. But this is it. He got an idea by putting the data together of the relevant exposure. Um, the exposome in 1854, this is another chart that was presented to the London Board of Health during the same discussion with Snow, and what you've got here is the two epidemic curves along the bottom that, um, that go up here are diarrhea cases and cholera deaths, and then everything else is uh, humidity and rainfall and all that stuff. This is our exposome study, except it's done on paper instead of on the computer, right? We want to know what lined up that kicked this off. Now, it doesn't measure everything, but we're still doing the same sorts of thing. So I, I really like this picture that's in this Cartographies of Disease book, um, and uh, it, it, it summarizes what we're after. Um, and sometimes simply lining up the data, not really doing any statistics. I wish this weren't as timely as it was. But as I, I ran it by some students yesterday. I said, should I keep this slide in the talk? And they said, well, there's not very much break between these. Um, in the New York Times covering the video posts that were on social media with the Las Vegas shooting, they went through and put the timestamps on lots and lots and lots of different ones. It's a very interesting 10-minute video that runs through the whole timeline of the experience, when the shots were fired, when there are breaks in the action, stuff that's happening. No single monitor captures that, but just by lining them up, we have a picture of the event that's very different. And so when I think of data integration and some creative things, this is an example. There's no statistics here, but I've learned something. I've made a cycle around. 
So thinking about integrating data doesn't necessarily mean finding exactly the right piece, but trying to put it together in a creative and informative way. And it allows you to refine your questions the next time around. Um, sometimes you need to select the right data. Um, this is a, a couple of maps from 1926 of endemic typhus fever in, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and I always ask the class, so which of these maps do you want? The one on the left is where the cases lived, and the other one's where they worked. And they all say, oh, it's the one on the right, because they're clustered together. So clustering is a good thing to pick out. But it does, because it says, where are they working? They're there at the bend of the Alabama River. Uh, that's where the farmers would bring the grain in, go into grain silos. If you pile up grain, you get rodents, and so this led them to think about rats. So uh, when we look at census data, we're not looking at where people work often. We are looking at where they sleep. So just to go back to that. Um, sometimes we have some data, but it might be the right data. So it's the data we can get, but what data do we need to answer the question? Uh, this is another one. Uh, Valentine Seaman made a map of yellow, yellow fever cases in New York City. This is about over 50 years before John Snow's map. Um, what you've got, it's got here is this concentration of cases. It's actually not quite as interesting as the other one, but you've got some marks here. Uh, he also noticed, noticed that the, the, the parts of the city there by the docks where the cases were, there were a lot of mosquitoes around. And then he said, well, the circumstances favoring the rise of the putrid miasmata um, also caused the insects. So we look at the data, but we also bring the filter of what we're currently thinking the causation me causal mechanism is. So even though we've put the data together, there's still an interpretation component. Now, some of that's quantitative, and we do that through our analytic methods, through data science and statistics. Um, but some of it is just what do we think the numbers mean when it comes out. Um, with measurement, the cost of generating data has gone way down. So we have, lots, we have low cost monitoring. We have rapid sharing of information. We have modeling. We can do the, some of the mathematical models of dispersion through the atmosphere, climate models, uh, modeling where the mosquitoes go at the individual mosquito level. We can do those kind of things. We're very data rich. We have big data. And the challenge is we've gotten through this first initial concept of generating lots of stuff and publishing things because we can measure it. And now we need to follow up with how should we measure it. This is always rethinking the design. Now, maybe that sounds like a thing a statistician would say, but the unhelpful comment from a statistician, and I'll play that role for a second, is to say, you have to design it my way because I've already figured out that problem. So I don't want to tell you the answer. I don't want to give you an answer and change your question because it's an answer I can provide. I think what we need to do, and the word foundations and fundamentals came up in the introduction, we need to back up. What are we generating? Where is the noise? How can we reduce some of that? And we've done this cycle with a couple of new a couple of breakthroughs, if you think about gene expression arrays, originally it was just measuring a lot of genes on a chip, which was a great breakthrough in measurement. But then if you're measuring all the tumor um, samples on one day, and the next batch you do is the control samples, you don't know if you have a batch effect or a tumor effect. So, and then they're adding replication in the chips. I want to measure thousands of genes. Why would I want to do them more than once? Well, you need to know some of the variability in that, and you could show the benefit. So we don't need to go through that exercise every time. We need to add a sort of fundamental concept of when new data are presented to us, what's the best way to incorporate them, and how can we learn about it? And I think that's where data science is different from statistics and different from computer science. And I think it's growing a set of foundations and fundamentals, but it's still very early in that process. And we've been very excited to show what we can do. And it's not nearly as glamorous to talk about how you should do it. But I do think there's a generation of science that needs to follow that. And I think that's some of the things we'll be talking about here. So we have big data, has lots and lots and lots and lots of different editions, and all of them have Vs. Um, I don't know what the right number is, but you know it's fast, it's big, and all that. You've, you've, we've all read those sorts of things. My summary is that you have more data than you know what to do with. Um, currently, you don't know how to handle that, so you're doing something different. That, tra so when, that means if someone says, I'm working with big data, I always think they're saying, I'm working with data I don't know exactly what to do with. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's not that they're naive, it's that they're developing. They are having to develop, I have data. They're often having to say what they're going to do with it. It's not standard. But as it becomes standard, it needs to come standard together. And, 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 and that's OK. I want us to acknowledge that, that integrating new types of data is sometimes a contribution in and of itself. And it may not be the perfect way to do it, but it may set us up for improving the overall system. Now, on the calculation size, the emergence of data science, and I, I pointed out someone says, you know, this, uh, this quote gets tweeted a lot. 
Um, a data scientist is someone who's better at statistics than a software engineer and better at software engineering than a statistician. It is somewhere in between computer science and informatics and math and statistics. Uh, we, you know, I think the key ideas from statistics is uncertainty and you can make mistakes, you want to minimize that. That's just some of the things you want to do. Um, with computer science, statistics, and math, the National Science Foundation had an initiative on, on uh, tripods, uh, transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research, and the principles of data science is trying to fund things to grow this concept of foundations. But, you know, the data, no data scientists were trained in standard old data science departments. We're all coming from backgrounds like this. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very interesting time to be involved. What statistics, I feel, does well is design experiments. If you know the uncertainty, you can try to control the uncertainty. If you can model the uncertainty, you can measure it and try to stabilize it. You can get inference from sampled populations, and you can take probability concepts of, in, of probability concepts of uncertainty and extend that to an inferential system. How do I make decisions with uncertainty? Um, I think statistics does that very well. And what computer science does very well is searching and sorting. And I don't mean that in a belittling way. That's very challenging to do. If you think of, uh, for those of us who are older than search engines, search engines are amazing things. Google Earth is an amazing thing. Google Maps is an amazing What I expect my phone to do is incredible. And it's not just a search algorithm. I, I know I'm, I'm doing that. I also know statistics isn't just about design. Um, Writing software for the people who are going to use it after you, I think, is a new, newer concept. Um, I, I think a lot of people have done that in sort of software engineering, setting it up. But a lot of us would program our own stuff and then hope the next reader of our paper programmed it themselves, too. That's not the case. Um, and, and we're going to, you know, we advance a lot faster by using the work of other people. If you, uh, also, computing isn't just that it's faster. Trying to use the fact you have a lot of data in a new way, if you think about how data translation algorithms, they crept along for a little while because they were trying to replicate what a human translator would do. Let me do each word. Let me check the syntax of the language I'm translating it into. Let me rearrange things. And then one of the things that really sped it up was, I have a lot of translations of War and Peace. I have a lot of translations of Hamlet walking by the theater here. Why don't I just see how people have, the thousands of people who translated it before have done it? Search it, put it together, bang, find the one that most people do. That often worked very, very well. Now, there's also breakthroughs in terms of the way the chips work and so on. There's a really nice uh, article about the AI chips for translation. But the big jumps are not solving the problem the same way a little faster. It's rethinking the, the problem you have. It doesn't mean the way you did it was before was wrong, but your capacity, you need to build towards your capacity and what you can do. It's the same thing with self-driving cars. We're not trying to create drivers like us, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I only have two eyes, and my phone's buzzing in my pocket, and the coffee spills and stuff like that. The car's got however many eyes it has. Um, so it, we need to think about it. It's not mechanically implementing the same thing we do faster, but it's trying to pull in more information than we ever possibly could do it. A, a computer should drive a car differently than I do for many reasons. Um, same thing with big data. Should we manage just st the same statistics faster? Well, I think we should keep the ideas that work very well, but a lot of statistical methods were developed when data were expensive and scarce, and you try to get the most information out of the least data. So we went from probability and built these elaborate bridges, which are wonderful calculations, but they don't necessarily, it's not a little adjustment over. Sometimes we have to go back to what the probability was and rethink this. So there's some nice papers about internet surveys. What do you do about that? I mean, it's a mess if you try to start at the end of the bridge of survey sampling, but there are some creative ways to think about it differently. So uh, I, I submit that, that this is a, a great time to think of new ideas. Um, one example is p-values. Nobody likes p-values. We write about it all the time, but they're really important. And the false discovery rate. And some of the first papers had a lot of math in them. It was kind of hard to figure out what it was, but the p-value is really the probability you rejected your null when you shouldn't have. Um, that's an important type of frequency of mistake to try to minimize. The false discovery rate is really, what's the probability that your null was true given that you have rejected this? Because you do so many tests, you reject a lot of things. How many of them are true detection, okay? Well, once you write it out as two conditional probabilities, you see they're not the same thing. They've switched the conditioning. Well, that's homework number one for Bayes' theorem. We do this all the time for what's the probability, given that you have a disease, what's the probability your screening test is positive? And then what you want to know is my screening test is positive, what's the probability I have the disease? 
we do this homework problem with a test that we, all of you have done this homework problem, I'm sure, and it turned out the trick was how prevalent was the disease in the background. So we do this for Masters of Public Health student, and they, they don't like the homework problem. We think it's a good learning experience for them. But it comes up again. If we switch things around, it sounds like the same question, but it's really not. So formulating the question you are answering and making it specific to what you're doing, one of the reasons the false discovery rate is helpful is we have mechanisms for doing thousands of hypothesis tests at the same time on the same data. Fisher never would have done that. He never had thousands of data sets ready to go. Um, but how would he have thought about it? He would have thought about what kind of mistake would you make and how do I, how do I quantify that? Uh, Google flu trends was an example where Google had uh, predictions based on search terms and a lot of other stuff, and it was doing about two weeks better than the CDC predictions until February of 2014 when it, it jumped, they tweaked the algorithm a little bit, and it was predicting twice as many cases as actually showed up. Um, the algorithm was closed. It's proprietary. It was kind of constant under continual development. And then when it went out of whack, they recalibrated. It actually works. Uh, it still works well, but it's not as hyped as it was before. And there's some critical lessons and a nice summary paper that's in the references at the end here. And the main points they were talking about, transparency and, and replication are important for answering these questions. I have to know how you did it to know where your answer came from. Um, that's tricky in a proprietary setting, but it is something to think about. Um, we want to use the data we have to understand the stuff we don't know well. We shouldn't throw out everything we know about epidemiology and disease surveillance just because we can get something faster. So calibrating it with what you know um, from the uh, subject area is important. We need to study how we did it and how well that works and why. So it's not just enough to put it through. It doesn't mean everybody has to know all the details, but I think those are important things. There's a science about understanding what we do. And it's not just about how much data you have. Having a lot of bad data isn't necessarily better than having a lot of good data. So to wrap up, I think we should be creative and, being, and be critical. So the Exposome provides an encompassing conceptual framework. There are a lot of new data sources, types, and combinations. We can search, sort, select, use statistics. What questions do we answer with the data we have? And what mistakes can we make? And can we minimize the probability those happen? Uh, this is a picture of John Tukey in front of a bunch of computer tapes. So that's big data at that time. One quote about being creative, it's a lot better to have an approximate answer to the right question than a precise answer to the wrong question. And you should be critical. Some combination of data and aching desire from answer does not ensure that a reasonable answer can be extracted from a given body of data. So we should think about both of these. Can you find a needle in a haystack? Well, it depends on the relative size of the needle in the haystack. Part of searching and sorting and doing statistics is to bring it down to a manageable, that's so the needle sticks out. Finally, it's always good to end with an Emerson quote. So nature's dice are always loaded. We don't follow independent and identical distributed. Her heaps and rubbish are concealed sure and useful results. And it's our job to help find those. So thanks. <laughs>